So today we are going to have a conversation that actually comes out of me being totally randomly invited to an, a gala because I had to step in for somebody. I was very happy because it was a connection with my Danish roots and I was sent to this gala where ISS had invited me, the big facility management company. And I was sitting at a table, some different people, different stakeholders, and somebody said, oh, you should have a chat with Kat. She's amazing. And then I started checking it out on LinkedIn. I thought, wow, this person is like, she's hacking LinkedIn. I don't know, like, wow, it's incredible what's going on here. And then I found out she was also talking about something that I know there has been both requests from the audience, but also something I myself have been quite involved in my journey diversity, inclusiveness, and belonging. And actually, how do you actually do that in a company, especially in a big company? Because there's, there's the intent, but how you do it, actually. And that's why we got Kat from ISS on board today, who actually, besides she's very active on LinkedIn, she's also walking under the banner of diversity, inclusion, and belonging, and actually involved in how you actually bring this to life in the front line. So that, that's the vision for the conversation today. And no more talk for me. Now, welcome to the show, Kat. I'm really excited about we, we get this opportunity to dive into this subject. Yeah, it's something I'm very passionate about. So yeah, I'm looking forward to have the chat today. And uh, to, to just to for people to, maybe some people know ISS, but other people think, what is ISS and what do they do? And also your own journey and actually how you actually ended up to be head of diversity and inclusion and belonging. Because I don't think, I don't know yet, I don't think it's something you study for, but you ended <laughs> no. up in, in, a, in a very unusual journey, like many people in the job and journey. So it'd be great to hear a bit about my, more about the company, but also your journey and how you actually ended and working with the That's diversity. Happening. Yeah. yeah, so ISS, yeah, facilities management company. We have uh, about 30,000 people across the UK and Ireland. So it's a big company, but we're global as well. There's 500 plus clients. We're, we're absolutely all over the place in terms of clients from Adidas, Samsung, Lego, NHS, very broad. But yeah, my background is absolutely not in facilities management at all. And if anything, I probably didn't know what facilities management was about three years ago before I started in the role. So my background is, is construction and engineering. I went to university and studied environmental sciences. I was very passionate about changing the world for the better, cleaning up the mess that basically had been made and uh, regenerating land. So that was my role for 16 years, mostly focusing on oil and gas. So very health and safety focused. Obviously, we were drilling on petrol station sites and oil refineries. So if something was going to go wrong, it was really going to go wrong. But as part of that role, the health and safety side, I really enjoyed that. It was that sort of connection with people, making people open up, saying like, what's not working? Because a lot of people will just put your head down, carry on working in conditions that aren't the best. So as part of that role, it was, I realized I had this skill for sort of connecting with people and making them open up to say, right, okay, I can fix this for you. It's within my power to, to change whatever it is, policy, documentation, getting different kit on site, PE, you know, whatever it was. So, so I sort of, I, I nurtured that and, uh, and that's what I enjoyed, but I'd had enough of the construction industry. It's horrendously male dominated and it still is. It was definitely a bit of a struggle at times to progress through the business as, as quickly as I wanted to and with the skill set that I thought I had. So I decided to just start completely pivot. And I knew someone at ISS already. It was a colleague I used to work with. And he said, well, come and have a look, see what you think. So I joined three years ago as a health and safety manager, middle management, middle of the business. Really enjoyed everything the company was doing. It's the most diverse workplace I've ever worked in from being that sort of lone female there was yes there was more women that were coming into the industry but in terms of other diversity it was really not there from a cultural point of view anything really so coming into this was actually quite a shock to the system and, and very refreshing so yes yeah, so I did that role for 12 months I had a very quick promotion through to take my boss's role when he moved on which was great they could see the potential in me which was fantastic and then I led a project on the menopause within the business we have a duty of care to look after our people and it was something that I realized that we were failing on having a menopausal wife at home who was really struggling. I sort of walked into the office and was like, why is no one else mentioned this? Why is no one else struggling? As soon as you, as soon as you say the word, it was like a magic key. Everyone was then opening up and saying, oh, I've been struggling with this. My wife's struggling with this. My partner's struggling. So for me, it was like a massive gap that was missing in the business. So I pushed it. It's something I tend to do. I tend to go a bit rogue every now and again. I pushed back to the business, created a policy and all the work around it. And, and that was a sort of springboard moment. I was asked to take on a brand new role for head of diversity, inclusion and belonging. 
to which I initially turned down because I didn't think I was competent to do the role. <laughs> a bit of a one trick pony was my thought at the time. That might have been a little bit of imposter syndrome, but I was convinced to take the role. And 18 months on, and it's, it's a different workplace. It's, it's absolutely fantastic, the amount of work that's being done in such a short period of time. And menopause is quite interesting because uh, Sandy, the people director, was on a panel was I also chaired. And like it was really interesting, the work you've done there and how you actually took something that is very difficult, which I know from my wife as well, to actually, how do you actually articulate that and put words on it in the workplace? Because it's a massive disadvantage to women mm -hmm. because there's something happening with their body they're not in control of and has a huge impact on their mental capacity, their performance. And it's very hard to put that out there in because we still, we're still in some many ways hanging a bit in the general sense in, in the industrial. Mm -hmm working environment so what exactly did you do tactically to get women to start talking about it? because the first thing you need to do I guess is to start talking about it. absolutely and as I say in my role at the time in terms of health and safety I was buzzing around all over the place client sites meeting lots of people and when they were asking the sort of projects I was working on I'd say oh we're doing this project on the menopause and instantly people were opening up about their symptoms and their experiences And I think that's what made me realize, I mean, my case study was my wife and my wife's fed off me talking about the menopause. Uh, but I think for me, we were very naive at the time. I'm going to go through it at some point. My wife is probably four years in, but we didn't know anything about it. You're not taught it at school, particularly you talk about your menstrual cycles, et cetera, that sort of hormone journey, but never the menopause. And there are 60 known symptoms of the menopause. And some of them are absolutely terrifying. So my wife was having sort of kaleidoscope migraines quite frequently to the point we had to take her to a and e to get checked she was having issues with her bowels to the point that we were convinced that she had bowel cancer you know these are terrifying things to be sort of constantly having to deal with when we ended up going privately to see a specialist and uh, basically yeah all of this all these symptoms she was having were all related to hormone deficiencies and fluctuations mm. and it was related to the menopause so again in terms of us in the workplace We could have people off sick. We could have people who have not slept properly the night before and then they're off driving around similar to the role I was doing. The, after the poor night's sleep and then driving 200 miles in a day, that's our duty of care is to look after those people. So that's what I did. I started sharing what I was experiencing at home from my wife's point of view and equally from my point of view because it was very hard when someone's struggling with anxiety and depression. It's That mental health piece is so difficult to deal with that's from a partner point of view was the bit that I was really struggling with so I was almost reaching out for support to say how do I support my wife to be the best that I could be to help her and again from a line manager point of view when I go through this I want my line manager to know how to deal with it as well and sort of reflecting on other people I'd worked with in my previous company before I moved across there was a woman who was my line manager for a portion of time she was coming up to her 50s absolutely fantastic technical everything just absolutely brilliant But there was a point where all of a sudden she seemed to be doubting herself and she ended up having, taking some time off work. She called it a breakdown, et cetera. But actually now with fresh eyes, it was all down to the menopause and she's on HRT now and absolutely flying again. So you're right. There's that point. You're, you're at that point of your career, really, in your sort of 40s, mid 40s, where you're, you're at the top of your game. You're aiming higher and all of a sudden your hormones are playing havoc and it's quite the struggle. It's quite interesting coming back to, to, to you as well, because actually something I mentioned before we started here and in our conversation, I've really noticed that due to you have the role, I guess, but also you're very open about your own life and sharing your own struggles and you're very open about being gay as well and the challenges around that. And you put up something this morning, as I just thought it was absolutely beautiful. So it says being gay is like glitter. It never goes away. Can you extrapolate that a bit? Because again, it's a bit like you are, I guess when you're doing that, you are helping others to actually say, yeah, it's okay. That's my identity. It's okay to talk about it and actually celebrate it and being you in a way. Absolutely. And I think when, so when I came out, I mean, I knew I was gay from the age of seven. I mean, I couldn't put a name on it. I didn't know that, but I knew that I, I wasn't like everyone, the other girls in my class and People say, oh, it's a phase. Oh, that's a phase. It's absolutely not a phase. And I, I knew that from a very young age, but it, it took me a long time to sort of work out who I was as an individual. And my space when I was at university, that really did, was that sort of key point for me of about having that space to I'd work out who I was as a person. And it was thing, sort of testing things out, like wearing a handbag. I don't, I look awful with a handbag, but I went through this phase where it's like, must fit in, must have a handbag. I managed to sort of shape who I was as a person over those three years. But when I then came back 
I got my first role in environmental consultancy, it was very much like, oh, and now what do I do? Because now I'm being, now I'm in a very male dominated environment. I would say partner all the time. I would never say girlfriend. So people would then add pronouns to your conversation. So if I, if they say what you're doing at the weekend, I say, oh, me and my partner went for a picnic. They'd say, oh, what does he do for a living? (laughs) So then you were like, okay, they've made an assumption. So you'd have to play along with it. And it was absolutely exhausting. You'd have to be so careful what you said, because I felt that my career potentially could be affected by them going, oh, oh, not only is she a woman, she's gay as well. So I very much kept it, kept it under wraps, maybe to the detriment of my career. I don't know. It's something I preach all the time is bringing your authentic self to work is the best for you and it's best for the business. So did I limit my own career early on? Potentially I did, but again, around being gay, it's very much, I call it cat flapping you're out and then you're in and then you're out and then you're in. I have to come out at really random times. Like we ordered some double glazing a couple of years back and the double glazing salesman asked if my husband would be joining me for the meeting. And I was like, no, but my wife will be joining me for the meetings. So it's all these sorts of things. I I have to cross names off of forms. Forms are always set up for Mr. and Mrs. I'm forever having to cross out the second box so that I can put my own details in because that's just how the forms are set up. So it is, it has been a difficult journey. And I think now that I, I'm very comfortable with where I am. I have a beautiful family and a beautiful wife. My position in the business is, is to be a very proud gay woman and that you can reach your full potential, whoever you are. So I think for me, I shout about on a daily basis to be that role model for others who are, are looking for where they fit in a business. And if we take it into your role in ISS now, Head of Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging, what is like your, what is that role encompass and what is the objectives with it and what do you do on a day-to-day basis if somebody was thinking out there, what, what exactly, Kate, what does he actually do besides yeah. go and talk about it in a situation like this? Absolutely. So my role is so, it's I've never had a role like it. I basically choose what I want to do on a daily basis, but the it never stops. It's absolutely constant. Just you think you've cracked something, something else will pop up or someone else's viewpoint will come in. So when this role came, obviously there was no one I was taking over from. This was sort of starting from scratch. So I took myself away for a week and got my head into a position of what do I want the business to look like? There's a three-year plan. So ISSA needs to be the company belonging by 2025. And that's something that we shout about a lot, looking at gender balance, culture, generations. This is a whole sort of suite of, of aims we've got in place that Margot Slattery sort of dictated, which is brilliant. There's a there's an equivalent of me in every country for ISS now, which again is great. So she's sort of got that momentum in all countries. But for me, the those targets were actually quite easy to reach. So there's a gender balance target for the SLT in the company. We've already hit the gender balance target already. So that's not a target for me. I like to be challenged. So basically I, I created this strategy that was, this is where we are as a baseline, but this is where I think we should be going. As a company, we should really be pushing the boundaries here. And what was nice was I was, again, testing the water of how much I could get away with and how much I could get commitment for. When I presented it to our CLT, Liz Benison, it was the best meeting I've had ever, I think, where she said, I means that's quite good, but actually I think we could probably go even bigger. So I was being pushed to say, actually, do you know what? That is a stretch, but we can stretch that even more. We need to be the lighthouse to show others, not only in ISS, but others, how we should be doing it. I've always been told in this position that I'm pushing on an open door and there's absolutely nothing that I've suggested that has been turned down. And I really do push quite hard on on certain things, certain initiatives, partnerships, and as I say, nothing has been turned down. They're completely on board as a business, which is fantastic. So in terms of a day-to-day role, we have employee resource groups that I set up when I took over the role. There's very much around sort of nurturing of those groups to make sure that they're functioning and they have the support that they need. They are basically the voice of the business. They tell me what's what we need to be focusing on, basically. I test ideas on them. They provide insight, which is great. I do a lot of these sorts of events, spreading the word about what we're doing as a business. I look at policies. I look at strategies. I work with our clients, for example, to, again, show best practice on what we're doing and suppliers as well. Because I say sit quite nicely in the middle. So, yes, we have our 500 plus clients. But equally, we have a whole supply chain behind us as well. So I sit really nice in the middle that I can go and do a supply chain event and tell them about how we're doing and what we're expecting from them. But equally, I can then go to a client site and say, look what we're doing and we can support you in your journey as well. Yes, as a company, you have a huge opportunity to impact a lot of people and a lot of things in the total value chain from where the product comes from, where the products end, how it's used, and the, all the people on that journey and show them actually there's a different way. And we can actually 
make the change that needs to happen across these things because i guess what you're doing as well because i went to one of your events actually in denmark it was very interesting to see how many of your different stakeholders that was there and they were quite inspired and went away from there and had to go home and ask themselves probably some questions as well it starts with the good questions all good mm-hmm. change starts with the really big questions as you said before what how is this all connected because you are a business and how is that then connected all these initiatives you're working on and strategies and maybe you can share some of these top pillars in your strategies how they connected to business performance because i guess in a way you wouldn't do this if it's not you already said it it's good for business this thing mm. Yeah, it's good for business and it's good for people as well. And that very much is sort of in line with our employee value proposition, which is be who you are, become what you want and be part of something bigger. So for me, as in terms of my journey through ISS, I am absolutely who I am, <laughs> authentically. So everything comes to work with me, including my children sometimes, which is nice. Become what you want. Again, I've navigated my way through the business to a position that my skill set is absolutely in line with. So my boss, Sandy, who did your previous event, she absolutely saw potential in me that I didn't see so she dragged that and said right this is where you should be sitting and that's where I, why I'm in my role today and be part of something bigger exactly as you say the influence we have as a business is absolutely phenomenal so if I can make something work in the business here that can not only go globally through ISS but again it goes through our clients and through our supply chain in terms of alignment I'm very much aligned with our social value strategy as well it has to be so there's someone who looks after that but again I link in with those to make sure our strategies are aligned but equally sustainability as well. It's just massive in terms of the sustainability targets that we have. So it's, it's not just I'm doing my I'm doing my own thing here. I've got that vision across what's happening across those other two areas as well. But equally within the people and culture team, I could dictate that I want more female engineers in the business, for example, or more veterans in the business. That's within my gift to, to push as a key performance indicator. But the bit that I said when I took this role is I can make things look great and I can talk about things, but if there's no action happening, then I'm not interested. And that's very much how I am as a person. I'm not willing to polish anything that it will look better than it actually is without the effort going in below. So for example, we have a joint forces program, which is about getting veterans into the workplace. It's a fantastic initiative and we've got some really good success stories of people coming into our business, but equally within our clients as well. So we take those people, we give them the mentorship, and we basically find them a role that, that suits their skill set from coming out of the forces. But again, if you don't have the culture within your business, and that's very much how I find that from my point of view as being gay, is that I know when I don't belong in a situation. I, if I walk into a bar and I think, no, nope, I don't belong here. This is not a space I want to be in. That's exactly what our business is like. So if we're bringing people in, if they don't feel that sense of belonging, they're not going to be comfortable. They're not going to be themselves. They're going to cat flap like I did. And then we'll lose them in 12 months. So you put all that investment into getting someone that key talent in the business and they're going to say, well, actually, this is definitely not a place where I think I can thrive. The culture's not there. So it's for me, it's that diversity plus that inclusion equals that belonging. That's the magic that we're trying to create in the business. And as you were talking about, like bringing people in, and I guess you have these challenges as well in in different areas of the business where lots of frontline employees is very hard right now to find Mm. enough of them and the right the talent have you seen like that this has been like a competitive advantage that you actually are working very active and you're communicating very active because also it's not just you talking about a senior your staff it's very clearly when you come to your sites that this is a living thing it's there's it's statements but there's things going on and you can see people are talking openly about whatever it is menopause being yeah. from underrepresented group or whatever it is. Yeah, I've definitely seen that. And again, there's people that I bumped into around the offices that have said, I've seen the work that ISS is doing. They've seen what I've been posting out about the initiatives and again, our comms team as well. And that was their decision point for joining the business. They had multiple options, but because they aligned themselves with our objectives and our goals, basically, that was the reason that they took the job. And again, that's fantastic for me. That's It's attracting that talent and being visible for the work that we are doing. The frontline placemaker is, we call them placemakers in our business, is a, is such a difficult bracket because they are so removed in terms of they don't have email addresses. Yes, we obviously we have contact details for them, but to actually be able to make the difference between for those people on the front line is such a challenge in a company this big. And that is still a challenge that I take on every day. So what I use is basically the tools that I know work from my health and safety background. So if there's any message I need to get out, 
to, to infiltrate all the way through the business. I'll do it in a toolbox talk format, which means it's a one or two page. It goes on a wall. Everyone understands them from a health and safety point of view. It means that I can get a really snapshot message out about whatever topic it is. We did one on the menopause when I did that project. And I have this lovely story. I went to a client site and I was in a dingy basement with a load of male engineers and I was just having a wander around. They didn't know who I was at all. They were, I was just cat from the office. So I was having a bit of a chat and they'd printed the menopause toolbox talk off in A3. It was absolutely massive on the wall. So I said, oh, I see you got the menopause toolbox talk. You know, what did you think? And they, uh, first of all, there was a bit of, oh, we're all menopausal now. Lots of jokes and sort of ribbing mm. and stuff. And I thought, oh, God, I'm not quite sure if this has landed or not. But then within a matter of seconds, they were like, actually, I think it might have saved my marriage. My wife is really struggling. She mm. has these sort of these episodes where she's just a complete anxious mess. I just go out, leave her alone for an hour, come back with chocolates and wine, and then hope that she's going to be all right at the end of it. So to be able to upskill people who is just a picture on a wall that obviously they, they've taken some note of, that's a mechanism that works. And that's then we've used that for prostate cancer. We've used it for some of the other initiatives that we've done around LGBT for, for Pride Month. So again, it's a mechanism that's already there. We don't reinvent the wheel. And I think that's the biggest piece of advice I can give is we don't, no one needs to start from scratch on any of this. The information's out there. It's readily available from, from many sources. So that's what I do. I take that information. We make our own version of it or use that directly. And then that's how we get our messages out. But it's, it's definitely a challenge yeah, to reach those frontline staff. Well, I think it's really great to hear that actually how you actually think about implementing it is almost like it is an operational initiative. It's not just fluffy comps. It's actually how mm. can it actually help you? And actually what, you know, I thought there was a very beautiful story there where you talk about giving people life skills because like when you give life skills, in my own experience, I have a background. I worked for McDonald's for many years and I stayed with McDonald's because they gave me more than the technical skills. They gave me life skills, soft skills mm. in principle. Mm. To And all those, so the most important skills I have in the businesses I'm involved in today is the soft skills that are in the McDonald's. There's no doubt about I, yeah. I owe McDonald's that. And I think when you're able to do that as an organization and you take very complex things and make them simple and then people can dive into the complexity to sell but it was really like you yeah. saved me i think it saved my marriage that's like the best yeah. feedback you, you can get i guess and i think it's about that vulnerability as well and that's something i always say in terms of leadership skills i'd say vulnerability is one of the, the top ones because again i talk about a variety of different things that are incredibly personal i always talk about how horrendous my periods are i've been through ivf that was absolute hell as well but i share that because i know that it's going to resonate with someone else and I get the feedback on a daily basis, either internally or through LinkedIn saying, thank you for saying that because I have equally struggled or this is my experience. So you then get someone sort of offload of this is how I'm feeling. I had someone message me. I did a post around Pride Month that was related to trans community. And someone I used to work with contacted me and said, Do you know, what? actually, I'm thinking of transitioning. It's so difficult, mental health, et cetera. So I was then allowed me to then connect him with my network to then say right I thank you for sharing that with me I can give you the resources you need by connecting with other people so that's so for me being vulnerable that allows other people to for that space too and that now works around our leadership team and we've had senior leaders in the business talking about their mental health we've got them talking about again menopause we've got them talking about prostate cancer absolutely a wide variety and a really nice story actually is one of our MDs for banking she did a tour around and again this is menopause focus as well her face was on a couple of the bits and pieces that I did I asked her to talk about her experiences of being menopausal and she was incredibly open it was I was quite surprised actually how open she was about her struggle and her symptoms and how she sort of cheats things like she, she can't remember people's names she has them on post-it notes and bits and pieces but someone had read that lower lower in the business frontline staff and she had a full conversation about all of these very personal symptoms that this woman was struggling with to the MD of the banking segment. You'd never have heard of that. I never would have spoken to my MD previously about anything so personal, but because she'd been so open, all of a sudden she was a safe pair of hands to trust with, what, you know, to share someone else's experience. So again, mental health has been a big thing for a very long time and we're very focused on well-being of our staff. And that's around that, that bringing your full self to work. So if you're struggling, say you're struggling and then we can provide the support you need in, in whatever format. So it definitely is the magic in that vulnerability and being open. And that's super interesting. You're talking about mental health because it's a big subject. It's been since the 
probably it was the big subject before the pandemic, but really have attention you know, with the pandemic and the aftermatch of that. And I think actually often mental health is when all these things in your wheel of life, your finances, your family starts to wobble and you maybe your health as well. If you have the, you stay at the menopause example, then yeah. you really feel that you're under attack because if to you to today, you understand what's going on you think you are ill with something that's the, the that's what i've learned talking with a couple of different women is like you feel literally that there's something that you mentioned it you have the cancer there's something really wrong you maybe have ms all kind of story i heard as well and that like and if you don't allow to share that people just think you are performing low and yeah. That's going to have a consequence for your career progression or the opportunities you've been given because it's not, maybe you don't feel it's okay to talk about. And I think also that vulnerability talking about it actually means when the tough gets tough, people get together because we've been vulnerable. So therefore we trust each other. We will, we'll go the extra mile now to get this project over the line or win the client or whatever it is, because we can trust each other in a way. Yeah, absolutely. And again, when I went through IVF, Again, if anyone's been through facility treatment, again, the toll it takes on you mentally and physically is just, you, it's un- unimaginable. I was very naive again going into it, thinking I could continue running it at 110 miles an hour as was my standard rate of working. But I had a conversation with my boss and said, look, I, this is what I'm going through. I need to be more flexible. I can't necessarily be off all over the place while I'm going through this treatment. And she was like, fine, like not an issue. You do what you need to do. But for me, the nice thing was the consistency within the business is the first round I went through, I had a different line manager, a male line manager. I told him the situation. I, again, felt a bit uncomfortable to begin with when I first joined the business to say, because it's difficult. You're telling your line manager, oh, I'm trying for a child, which means I might be out of the business for 12 months. It's, again, career limiting. I, all of a sudden, oh, let's not put cat forward for that because she's thinking of starting a family. But very difficult. But again, the experience I had was, what do you need? Are you looking after yourself? Let's not do that call on a Friday afternoon. How did that go? So you knew that someone cared and someone was keeping an eye. And if I can make sure that everyone has that same experience in the business, whether that be IVF, whether it be cancer treatment, whether it be whatever whatever it is, again, you're right. I would absolutely go the extra mile for the business when it's needed because I know that they were looking out for me when I really needed it. You talked about some amazing initiative and you talked about you had some KPIs in place as well as on target. How do you actually measure these things? Because I guess it's you get the feedback when you're out or you hear stories, mm-hmm. people reach out to you. That's some kind of sentiment saying that, yeah, there is, this is working. It's changing something in people's life. But how do you measure the success of it and knowing where you have to put, because I guess you have limited time. And resources, that's also, where do you put the 20% that gives 80% in principle? Absolutely. So each of our employee resource groups, they have their own individual KPIs. So I basically run them all as tiny businesses. So they have their own steer codes with co-chairs and deputy co-chairs, budgets, communications, comms. So they are like their own little machines with their own KPIs they're aiming for this year and then up to 2025. So for those ones, if they're going to put like an awareness event on, and this year has very much been about raising the awareness of our business forming those groups so they're solid and they're functioning next year we'll probably we'll tackle bigger projects although a few has snuck into this year but we measure things like the attendance webinars we had a brilliant event here this week for armed forces day so our military community put on an event we had some guest speakers in and it was phenomenal the response was absolutely brilliant the office was full we beamed it across to our stoke office it was recorded as a webinar so for us it's working out what what worked there. Was it the amount of time we gave? Was it the appeal from the guest speakers? Was it? So it's almost that sort of unpicking afterwards. Why was it such a success? And there was some fantastic food put on because it was a tea and toast event is how it was branded, which is very military sort of sort of space for chatting. There's some lovely food put on as well. So again, that's always a draw to the office as well, isn't it? But again, getting people into offices, it's obviously facilities management. We need bums in the office. And that was, again, that sort of collaborative learning space where we had an absolutely packed office and clients in as well. Again, if we've run some webinars, which ones have been successful, which ones have had the really high numbers and which ones haven't. And I think it's about making sure that you're engaging with a lot of people. So, for example, for International Women's Day, we're going to do the same for International Men's Day. We did an awards. So it was inspirational female leader, male ally, rising star. There was probably about six awards in the end. And it meant that anyone in the business could nominate anyone, any level. And we had... 350 nominations I think in the space of a a, a couple of weeks everyone who was nominated got a certificate so LinkedIn just went absolutely ISS blue for the period of a week where everyone was showing off their certificates that they'd got it didn't cost us anything at all but the recognition 
that you had been nominated for something was just so wonderful for everyone. We then had the awards given live on a webinar, which probably about, I think I managed to total, it was probably about 700 people on the call in the end. There was offices all ringing in with groups of people. It was, we pretty much crashed the platform we were using because so, so many people wanted to know whether their person they'd nominated had won or not. There's a lovely hall of fame, et cetera, at the end of it. So what made that such a success? It's because we, we got the business involved. Show off, show us your talent. Why are these people so important to you? They then got the feedback as well as part of their nomination. So that person's not only have they had a pat on the back and a certificate to say you're being recognised, you're visible in the business, but you know that's what everyone wants, isn't it? Everyone wants a pat on the back and it's that purpose and that that passion that people have. But that visibility is key. You know, you need to be seen in the business. And again, that was a platform for us to raise people up. So we're going to be doing the same thing for International Men's Day, and I'm sure it'll have exactly the same the same amount of impact. So that is, I mean, that's the main thing for this year. Again, that, that awareness piece, what is working and, and what is the secret source that actually gets people engaged in events. Yeah, and then repeat that, I guess, like any other things in, in business, it's like finding the algorithm that really works. And it's really interesting to to see actually when you suddenly make people show the best version of themselves and like how interested people are in that and actually give them a voice. And I think often leadership is... The most important is to be be vulnerable. That's what you can do yourself. But then how do I break down the barriers to give people a voice? I call it permission to operate in principle. How do I give them permission to operate and be themselves? Yeah. And that's what works really nicely in the ERGs as well, is that I, I said very early on that my face will get very boring very quickly. So now I get asked to do panel events and bits and pieces all the time. And I absolutely love doing them. But now it's a case of actually, you don't need me. You need this person over here because they chair this ERG. They are doing amazing work. Go mm. and speak to them. So now I field out as probably about 80% of my uh, panels to the people that they're doing the day to day. So again, from that skills side of things, it's something that they're very passionate about. It's on the side of their desk. They're going the extra mile to get this work done. Now they've got their own platform that they can say, well, this is what I'm doing. I'm leading this team. And again, that's fantastic. That's how I sort of came into this role. So give everyone else the same opportunity. If we So if we take it out, out of ISS and I'll be more in the meta world where we talk a bit about challenges around really getting diversity, inclusion and belonging on the agenda. And there's lots of great things happening out there, but we all know we're not there yet. But what is like your view of working with it today to day? Where are we? And are we close? Are we far away in your view? I think there's, I think a lot of people are on a journey on this and that there's a lot of people that a lot of companies that are getting this sort of similar person to me in role to, to start to sort of strategize it and move things forward for them. Whether some of that is just an illusion or whether they actually buy into it is, is will remain to be seen. But I think, again, we did meet in awards and again, the people in the room that night were, you could feel the energy from everyone. They obviously all deserved and worked very hard to be in that room. And that's what I experience when I go to other events like that as well. For us as a business, I, I had conversations with senior leaders in the business who safe space environments, one-on-one to say, look, what are your thoughts on this? And you're the one that needs to be speaking this across the business. I need you to believe it so that, again, it's not just my voice. Again, it's their voice as a senior leader in the business. What was interesting was I had a, a conversation with one of our male MDs who said, I don't understand this gender balance thing like why is this so important like I just employed the best person for the job they, that just so happens to be and then when you looked at his SLT it was all white men I was like but in terms of that sort of diver- diversity of thought I had this one-on-one I said be absolutely blunt with me tell me what your thoughts are and I'll we'll just have a conversation and by the end of that chat he was like oh okay okay no I understand that now next thing he's on his SLT call saying I've spoken to Kat and actually what we need to be doing is so to have that time where he could be very honest and did he use the right language? No, he didn't. And did I pick him up on it? I corrected him as I went along. But he would have sat there just bubbling under the surface thinking, well, I don't understand this. I'm the best person for the job. Yes, we do need to employ the best person for the job, but there needs to be that diversity within your team. So, you know, who is on the panel with you deciding who is the best person for the job? So that was really nice. And you can see that was then filtering through the business. And when I linked each of the SLT members have a, an ERG that they're aligned to, And when I had that conversation with them and the CLT about who they were going to be aligned with, I asked them what they felt comfortable with and what they didn't feel comfortable with. So they were all like, oh, I feel comfortable with gender balance. They thought I should show about abilities or happy with culture, not so happy with generations and age. When I paired them up, I gave them the one they felt least comfortable with. And they all went, oh, like, why have you done that? And again, when I took my role, Liz Benson, our CEO, said, make everyone feel as uncomfortable as possible. 
which is very difficult as a people pleaser to suddenly then give everyone this sort of like, oh no, what are we going to do? But what it did was it gave them all that push. So yes, they would naturally gravitate to the one that they felt comfortable with anyway, but to push them to one that they didn't feel comfortable with, push them outside their comfort zone, listen to the conversations that are happening so that they, not necessarily when they're on the meetings, I always say to them, you don't need to be filling the spaces. That's not your job. You need to listen to what's being said and then support using your power in the business, your network to then support that message and be the voice for that group of people, whoever it is. So that for me has worked really well is everyone says about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. I pushed them because they weren't going to make the jump on their own. And actually that, that has worked really well in our business. So that would be my, my recommendation to anyone is yeah. Navigate people towards the uncomfortable. Yeah. And I guess that nothing changes by being comfortable and you have to be uncomfortable then change comes because then you start thinking and seeing the world in a different light or you look for different ways to solve problems in a way so i think it gives totally sense yeah. what about in iss because also i guess uh, we've talked a bit about before there's like lots of unrepresented groups in the workforce nationally or globally what are you doing actually to help promote them you talk about the veterans where you say yeah. okay actually there's actually a lots of potential there because they're done in the army doesn't mean they can come in and contribute in ISS and I think that there's definitely more light on that in general with the staffing crisis but is there any other groups where you're doing specific work mm. to actually bring them in give them a job and actually give them a, a meaning purpose and they are an income for that sake yeah so we a lot in our NHS side of the business our healthcare side of the business we work with project search which is about getting people with autism into the workplace and this is one that I think is absolutely critical because so my son is diagnosed autistic and ADHD so I understand that again this sort of perspective from home life to then going into work life I have to when I talk to my kids I have to use two very different language like communication styles I can tell my daughter for example can you let the dog out the dog will be let out let back in again, fed played with everything will be sorted if I ask my son to let the dog out the dog will be let out the dog will bark at the back door because I didn't say and back in again so again, in terms of that line management piece, you could say, I could say, oh, well, he's, I'm not going to employ him because he's not using his initiative. He's not, he's, why could he not have let the dog back in? The dog was barking. The signal was there to let the dog back in. But again, in terms of how his brain works, he needed more information than I had given him. So again, from a business point of view, one way of doing things, one way of doing interview techniques is not sufficient. Again, providing questions beforehand yes okay there's an advantage it gives everyone an advantage they can prepare the answers but equally why should we not give the questions before so that you can get the best out of that person because you're going to be able to tell quite quickly if someone is putting it on by adding digging a little tiny bit deeper but give them the information beforehand so that is something that has been brilliant to have that as part of a healthcare segment and then we're going to roll that across the rest of the business so that we do support more getting more people with autism into the business but again, in terms of that inclusion and belonging piece, for me, our offices are very bright. I'm all right at the minute in this room here, but if my son came in, he could not work in this environment. So again, it's around creating spaces and providing noise cancelling headphones, whatever it is that's needed to be able to make sure, again, people thrive in the space they're in. We've got a project that's going on with one of our clients. Again, our clients approached us and said, we want to, get, we want to focus on people with Down syndrome and getting them into the workplace. So again, brilliant for us. We did a joint project with the client. And that's going really well as well. Yeah, there's loads. And again, the Joint Forces program has been really eye-opening for me as well. And what was really nice is last year, we did a SAS Who Dares Wins type game. That's the program where everyone gets sort of off the go, marching out through forests and bits and pieces. So we did our own ISS version that was led by the veterans in our business. So they took on a, an exercise each. And we had to go around as an SLT, all mixed up together, and go and do this, these, these initiatives. And what was really interesting and that everyone at the end of the day went, right, I get it now, is that teamwork, it was the communication, it was the thinking outside of the box. But I think we're quite lucky that we just sit in the office and if something goes wrong, I can ring somebody, I can just work my way around it. But the exercises they were doing about observation and yeah, how to use what you've got in front of you to make things work was just really eye-opening. And everyone kind of went, okay, I can see how logistics, communication, teamwork, these are massively important skills for anyone in a business and they are in absolute bucket loads in that group of people so that was really nice again was a sort of penny drop moment for a lot of the SLT to say why we're not getting more people from veterans military community into the business so yeah that's been working really well 
Yeah, and I get that well, one of the interesting thing when I'm involved with anything, I never ever got, I got a knee injury and didn't get into the military. But what I learned from some of my friends and also colleagues at True is that they have this ability to take people in that would never ever thrive anywhere else and actually make them able to go and get a job afterwards or have a mm-hmm. life because of the structure, the discipline and McDonald's I work with have a similar thing with young people that come in totally reckless. I've hired some people that say, he's never going to work. She's never going to work. Where to see? We'll just have to train them and actually be patient, be hard on yourself and patient with them. And often I think in leadership, we forget this. We need to give people that initial chance. They are not all coming in and doing things perfectly from day one. It's more that they show the effort. And I think the effort, many people want to show the effort, but they also need somebody to believe in them. As you said, you need somebody needs to believe in you yeah. and to put you in the position to be able to actually do things. And I think the military are really good at that. Any advice you would give to other organization, because there's leaders in this audience listening into this, there's representing organization and are also trying to do this because they know it's the right thing, but also they know there's an opportunity to solve some staffing challenges at the same time, if you get it right, as you, you also said before. So, so what is like, where should they start to improve this? Because you are, you come from a, a strong organization with lots of resource and you can do things that might maybe a small organization with 500 people will feel, but yeah, but that's, that's out of our reach to do these mm-hmm. things. I think I would say a lot of what I did when I first took over the role was all free of charge. I didn't have a budget. I started mid-year. There was literally no pot of money for me to suddenly go, right, we're going to go and do this. So it was a lot about using my own resources to to get things set up. So I'd say that there's nothing that, that is a roadblock for anyone jumping on this and getting quite a lot of traction quite quickly. My background in construction, I'd never heard of an employee resource group at all. So when I joined ISS and everyone said, oh, have you joined the Pride ERG? And I was like, Googling, what is an ERG? Because I had literally (laughs) no idea. So in terms of giving people a space, a dedicated space of time that's not going to cost you at all, give them a lunch break where they can all get together and chat about what their thoughts are on the business, what they think needs changing in the business. What works brilliantly here is something that I started this year as well is we have like a brunch event. So we'll do it on a Friday lunchtime, sort of mid-morning, and we get the CEO or some of the CLT members on a bit of a hot seat panel. And then we get sort of 30-ish placemakers from all around the business, all different levels, all different segments. And we'll pick a topic. So we've done one for one around gender balance. We've done one around culture, race, and ethnicity. We've got one on abilities coming up. And I basically it's for Liz Liz starts fantastically every time she sort of does her pitch on what she thinks about the topic what she agrees with what she struggles with her vulnerabilities around the topic and her sort of perspective that then creates a space where everyone can then go okay actually this is what I think or this is what I've experienced or this is what how I've been spoken to or this is the language that I've experienced or so what is great is that there have been a lot of very personal stories shared as part of these sessions that are heard directly by the CLT. So it's not filtered. I don't, I hear a lot of stuff, but again, I hear it and then I tell it on, but the context is completely different to hearing someone say it, how they struggled to come back to work after maternity leave. They wanted some flexible leave for three months, but they got bounced around, bounced around until the point where they were pretty much take off sick because they were so stressed at the situation they're in. No, should not be happening. So the, that completely doesn't cost anything at all. It just gives people the, the airtime with, with senior people in the business to say, this is my experience of the business I work in because we don't see everything. We're not everywhere all the time. So that's really good. And again, in terms of your policies, policies are those things that just sit on a SharePoint or in a folder until they are needed. And then people come out and go, okay. When I had my kids, I didn't carry my kids. So I went into work and said, oh, I'm going to be a mum, but I'm not carrying my kids. So they said, oh, we don't have a policy for that. Here, have the paternity policy. So my policy said he, him, father all over it. That's not who I am. That's not how I identify. She, her are my pronouns. But I had to sign this policy because there was nothing else that I could use. Five years later, when I had my daughter, same policy was rolled out to me. So in, again, in terms of me being represented in the business, not fit for purpose at all. And how did that make me feel? Pretty naff. And did I hang around? No, I didn't. So have a look at your policies. And again, there are people out there who can review those and make sure they're completely inclusive and they can standard again you don't need to have buckets of money to then say right we're going to do 52 weeks of parental leave but there are steps you can put in place in bite-sized chunks that can improve for the business and that's something that we've paid into we've partnered with Stonewall now as part of our parental policy refresh 
Stonewall obviously are absolutely fantastic in terms of the work that they do for the LGBT community, but equally the language that's being used. So they are reviewing our policies for us. I'm not an expert in any of this. So I get the experts in. So they are doing that piece of work for us to make sure our policies are inclusive. And now we're partnering with them on a family formation guide and their IVF for all campaign. So again, not only we're waiting, it's Pride Month, it's June. I've got my Pride socks on. That's great. The office looks fantastic. But what are we actually doing for the LGBTQI plus community? We are partnering with Stonewall and we're making a difference. So that family formation guide is basically a best practice for all businesses to say, this is what you should do to be able to support anyone who wants to start a family in their career from fertility treatment, time off, keep in touch days, and then the support on the back end of it. And our name will be branded all over it because we believe so much in it. So I think kind of pick where you want to start because again, diversity is massive. Yeah. You change again as a person, as you go through your career, my life was very much turned upside down when I became a parent. You know, I then sort of fell into a new category. So not only was I sort of the gay category, the woman category, the parent category, at some point I'll be a carer. It, it goes on, menopause, it will go on and on. So again, pick the top things that your business or your employees are saying you need to focus on and, and aim for those first and then the rest of it will naturally come. Yeah, so identify those 20% that gives 80% here and now and actually where you can get people behind as well, I guess. like So you can have that first success and then you can build on that yeah. from there and we say again something that comes out of our meetings we when we're looking at projects we call them either speedboats or tankers so you want to get a couple of speedboats going where you can show that there's some something happening easy wins in the business but in the background you need to know that there are those tankers that are chugging along that are actually going to make the bigger difference moving forward but you've got you've still got the action that's happening that everyone can see but you know that the difference is in the culture is happening on those bigger projects yeah yeah, yeah. really good analogy and it goes for everything you do in, in, in business often you're focusing on that big massive change and it yeah. never happens because you didn't actually put out your feelers or your early traction to actually validate if what you're doing is actually the right thing and then you can still steer the big change in the right direction if it doesn't work with small one what is like the top goal right now where you are what is the top goal when it comes to diversity inclusion and belonging right now what is that we need to hit to to get the big tanger over the line i think it is very much around the culture of businesses that's i've had a couple of people come into the office in the last couple of weeks and they said as soon as you walk through the door you can feel that this is a place that is a nice place to be it's a nice yes we've got lovely offices but as you walk in it's how everyone acts it's the respect and that is something that's key in the business is that respect before understanding and that's something that i bang on about on a daily basis in here just because you don't understand something doesn't mean to say you can't give that respect. But what's lovely for me is that, yeah, that is the feedback that I get when people come and wander around any of our sites, ISS or our client sites, is that culture is there and it's growing. We're not there yet. Yes, I've got a plan for 2025, but there's also a plan that goes beyond that as well. That again, yeah, puts that into turbo charge, I think. It is definitely a, a never-ending beast. There's so much to focus on to make sure that, again, the dimensions of diversity are pretty much limitless what's best practice now might not be best practice in a year's time so it's just making those steps for each one of those so you're focusing on as many as you can to make that difference but the intersectional piece is absolutely key and that's something I always say to our ERG leads is if it's a swimming pool and you're in your swim lane for gender balance or abilities or pride you're still in the same swimming pool and you need to know what's happening across so there's nice, we do little, we'll do joint events. So for example, the Pride ERG are linking with our culture, race and ethnicity team for Pride Month. So we've got a nice bit around Black Pride as well. Abilities are doing something with our generations and age around family. We're bringing kids into the office, which seemed like a really good idea at the time. But I'm not quite sure how that's going to go. And again, that stemmed from the fact that I brought my kids in in the summer holidays last year. No one brings their kids in. Who brings kids into an office? It's not a thing that's done. Well, mine came in for lunch. Everyone loved it. The kids loved it. And what was nice for me is that my daughter was doing the, oh, you're going to London again. We never see you. You're not doing the school run. Heartstrings being pulled on. <laughs> what was nice for her is that she could then see where I work, where I come to. Yeah. So, so if I'm in today, she'll say, well, where did you sit? Did you sit near the yellow creative room or did you sit next to the... And I'll say, oh, this is where I was. And for her, it almost allows her to go, okay, this is where I know where she's going. So we decided that, again, we'd do this across all of our ISS offices. People can bring their kids in on a day in the summer holidays. There's a nice little picnic. There's a bit of a treasure hunt around the offices, et cetera. So that 
not only again that's a massive part of our lives we all have families of some sorts people are bringing their dads in people are bringing their granddads in bring that in so that they can see where you work and again we get to know each other that, that bit better in terms of that, that sort of link and that trust in each other that this is the rest of me that you don't see behind behind the camera so some lovely initiatives that's not that idea because you have to be very comfortable about yourself as a culture to do that and then i i'm not barking up a tree i'm normally quite honest but i i thought when i had to visit an iss site between you and me and the audience wherever listen to this that this is going to be very corporate and it's going to be quite stale that's what's like my and i met some lovely people before then and i thought i'm probably welcome it's not that but the hospitality and the interest that was in me and what i was doing i was like wow okay this is like the script book from Danny Meyer on hospitality. Like the interest that was for me from I met the receptionist to I work with the people in the kitchen. It didn't matter what seniority I met. There was like this genuinely feeling that actually people were interested why we were there. Yeah. And I don't see that everywhere. And I've never, I know, because I had that perception as well. I, of course, I had my my barriers I needed to get down. And I was like, wow, okay, actually, it's not just in the world. It's actually, they're really interested in making the places work where people work, like making them inclusive and the employee experience really. And you could feel people were free to talk with people. It's not that thing, oh, well, he's probably yeah. senior, so I shouldn't talk so to him. Yeah. yeah. And again, all over the wall, it says people make places. And that is exactly yeah. what we stand for. We know we're, we don't have a product. That's not with facilities. There are buildings that sit there, but it's the people that really make it. And again, that's why we invest so much time in listening to them and making sure it's the best experience it can be for them, because then it makes the best experience for who comes through the door. And Kat, another question that was on my mind, I was preparing for this, and I probably often ask guests this, but I, I because I'm very interested in that, because you're marching under a banner that's, that's a difficult banner, I would say. It's a difficult challenge, and you make it feel so easy. But, but how do you show up like pro and that energy you put in and on LinkedIn? And so on, how do you do that? How do you create it? Because like lots of people, how the hell is she doing that? I'm quite sure they would say, how does she find the time, the headspace, the broadband? What are your secrets? Do you have any secrets? It's, I think it's, this is definitely the hardest role I've done. And when I was approached about the role, I said I wasn't, I felt it was quite fluffy. I wasn't a very fluffy person. <laughs> and Margot was like, oh my goodness, Margot Slashu, mm -hmm. our global lead was like, it's not fluffy. But again, I think in terms of my background, it has been project management, finance, team, it's really hard skills. And they're the ones that take you far. I think I hadn't realized actually the power of the softer skills which is actually well within my capability to do. So I'm in a really nice position that I understand all the hard stuff and I understand all the commercials, but equally I can create those spaces where people feel safe. The issue I do have is this, the switch off. This is like the hardest 24 seven job I think I've had because I am so passionate about it. And again, I do need to rein myself in. Sometimes I get reminded by my wife and kids to put my phone down quite regularly because I, I have a lot to say. Now I've been given the space to be able to say and the platform to be able to say what I want to say. Definitely. I mean, the power of LinkedIn, I mean, 12, 18 months ago, I think, oh, that's quite good. That's quite good. You know, some decent messages here. It was only that when I sort of dipped my toe in and thought, well, I'm, I'm going to start sharing some bits that it just absolutely snowballed. So yeah, it's the trick I have is making sure that I know when I need to switch off. And I have got to the point earlier this year where I had to take a holiday. I literally booked a holiday 10 days beforehand to go away and do nothing because I had reached absolute saturation. You end up taking on a lot. I hear a lot of stories and a lot of difficult situations that people have been in and that can be quite tough. But but no, I think it is about making sure I look after my own mental well-being first. But I absolutely love what I do and I can't imagine doing anything else now. I know it very well myself. When you live your purpose and you love what you do, the stop button is very hard and the line between what's work and what's private become very hard. And the rest mm -hmm. is not something you do because there's so much to get done. And exactly, it's, it's okay, but you also have to think about other people in that. So I really follow you on that. I think there's lots of senior people and the founders that really love the thing they're doing, really struggle with it. And I can't, sometimes it's almost, it just takes you. It's like you become it and you, it's very hard. But it, uh, so it's finding those and actually get people to help you. I do the same as you. I have my family and friends to help me. And I have a specific friend that calls me every week and says, when are you actually off this week? Because I could work seven days a week if I was allowed. Yeah. But I don't. But if I was allowed, I would do that because I'm very passionate about what I do as well. Yeah. So is there anything you wished I've asked you I didn't ask you? And what would that be? 
That's a good question. I wish that you had asked me what my proudest moment was in mm. my ISS career. Yeah. And what is and that? The answer, and the answer is, so last month, might have been the month before, I won a Diva Award for so it's yeah. Diva Magazine. And it was completely unexpected, like completely unexpected. I knew I'd been nominated and it was a public vote. I had put it out on LinkedIn. I put it around our internals as well. And my wife decided she was going to attend with me. She never attends things with me. She can't think of anything worse than an evening out networking with me. But she said she wanted to attend. And we were on the, in the car on the way there. And she said, oh, if you win, it says you need to have a speech prepared. So what are you going to say? And I said, well, I don't need to think about this because I'm not going to win. And she said, but if you do win, you need to make sure you thank, you know, Liz and Sandy. And you need to make sure that you say these bits and pieces. And I said, I literally tuned out because I was actually on my phone doing work at the same time, which again, frowned upon. But so I kind of, she was talking and I wasn't really absorbing. The, on the evening, I saw so many amazing people there that had all been nominated for different bits and pieces, some in my category. And I was having a lovely evening. And I said, oh, I reckon I might be in a shot for highly commended but that'd be maximum and then my award category came up and someone else's face came up on the screen for highly commended and I was like so I sort of I literally sat back in my chair I was like well I'm having a lovely evening I'm here with a brilliant group of people from ISS there's all sorts of people in the room I can network with and my wife said like great and then Lucy Spragan was giving the award out who's one of my favorite singers she was listing off oh this uh, this person was most recently on the women to watch list for and then it was women in hospitality and transport and leisure and I thought I was on that watch list. I thought, surely no one else can be on that watch list. And I did that thing, you shuffle in your seat, like, oh my goodness, I think I've actually, oh, I think I've won it actually. And then my face was absolutely massive on this screen. I burst into tears, my wife gave me a hug. And then I had to go and up to the stage and give a speech, which I had not prepared at all with a tear in my eye and a frog in my throat. That was for me, totally unexpected. The caliber of people who were in that category as well, I think really made me reflect that actually the progress in my role and the progress with the ISS within such a short period of time for that award to be given to me and the work I've done in the business. I think that really was sort of, that was a bit of a firework as well for, right, well, if I can do that in this period of time, what can I do in another 12 months? So that's really been the sort of ramping up what do we want to aim for next and what do I want to aim for next in, the, yeah, in my role. So yeah, that's definitely my proudest moment. Yeah, and congratulations for that. Of course, yeah. I should have asked you that question. So, so it's very good you hooked it up because I think we talked about it actually previously. So I think it's a very big award if people go in and look at it because I can remember when we had the pre-conversation to this, you just won it at that time. It was a couple of days after. Yeah. I was still in shock. <laughs> yeah, you're still in, in the shell shock, I would say almost. <laughs> uh, where can people connect with you? Because I'm sure there's some people out there thinking, I would love to talk with Kat. I, would, I, feel I got really inspired. I want to know some more how can I follow her to learn or just get inspired where's the best place we already talked about LinkedIn so I LinkedIn, guess LinkedIn. all over LinkedIn yeah Kat Parsons yeah. and then I also am trying to delve into Instagram as well because I had a really good call with Google a couple of months back and they were saying about you need to communicate people with, with people in seven different ways apparently because of the generational yeah. how everyone prefers so I decided to try and diversify so uh, I'm also on Instagram so that's Kat Parsons ISS you have a look on Instagram as well yeah, it's called the zero moments of true. Eleven hours of content, seven touch points, and uh, yeah. four interactions. Yeah, uh, great. Thank you so much, Kat, for taking out time to come and talk about diversity, inclusiveness, and also belonging, and actually what you do at ISS, but also your own personal journey, and actually what you can achieve in a little time when sometimes you get out of your comfort zone and actually do something that you never expected you could do. Yeah, absolutely.